Hi everyone, in this presentation I will talk about unsupervised learning of speech representations, which is a kind of hot topic these days in the research community. In particular, I would like um, to describe a couple of works that I have recently published in uh, this uh, um, area with the collaboration of uh, Santiago Pascual, Juan Serra, Antonio Bonafonte, and Joshua Benjo. The presentation is structured as follows. First of all, I will describe why unsupervised learning could play an important role in the future of artificial intelligence. Then I will introduce what is self-supervised learning, and then I will describe um, our um, our first attempts to learn uh, speech representation, which is local infomax, based on maximizing mutual information between two encoded representations. Uh, then uh, I will describe our um, latest attempts called problem agnostic speech encoder where we jointly solve a multiple self-supervised tasks and we are able to learn very general and transferable speech representations. Finally, I will conclude uh, this work with some uh, ideas also for, for future uh, research on that. So, why unsupervised learning? Well, let me first of all say that deep learning is really about learning good representations. In particular, we want to learn uh, automatically from data hierarchical representations, which are a very efficient way to describe our input signal. Uh, for instance, the typical example that is done is with images in which we can uh, feed a neural network with some row pixels, the first layer detects some edges, then we can combine some edges to detect part of the face, and then we have a final layer that is able to predict the full faces. Of course, also other signals, including speech, for instance, follows this kind of compositionality principle. In the speech case, we can um, gather samples to create subphonemes units, then we can create phonemes, uh, putting together phonemes we can have words and finally sentences and then uh, the meaning of what is a term uh, by the speaker in the speech signal. Normally, these representations are learned in a standard supervised way where there is a label, where there is an annotation that can guide us. Uh, the question is, uh, can we learn this kind of representations in a totally unsupervised way? Well, unsupervised learning is learning without a teacher, learning without a label that can help us learning good representations. Uh, in the machine learning community, there is a kind of agreement on the importance of unsupervised learning. For instance, there is this famous joke saying, that if intelligence is a cake, reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake, the icing around the cake is supervised learning, while the cake itself is unsupervised learning. In fact, there are several good reasons why we think uh, unsupervised learning could play a very important role in the future of uh, artificial intelligence. First of all, um, humans learn a lot in an unsupervised way, uh, just observing the world around us. And thus, uh, uh, with a kind of unsupervised learning approach, we can uh, acquire a general knowledge uh, on the world around us that can help um, the systems uh, and artificial intelligence to perform a much more rapid generalization to new tasks. Uh, more practically, the process of um, data annotation uh, is really very really expensive and thus most of the data are still available without any kind of label, without any kind of supervision. And it will be thus uh, very important to find 
a proper ways to extract the knowledge to, to extract the information of within this data also without any supervision in the last years we have seen numerous attempts to uh, perform unsupervised learning popular approaches are for instance the deep belief networks uh, with the restricted multiple machines the autoencoders more recently variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks. A subfield that is gaining popularity, especially in the computer vision, is self supervised learning. What is that? Uh, self supervised learning is a type of unsupervised learning where the supervision is extracted from the signal itself. In practice, in the context of self-supervised learning, we apply a kind of known transformation to the input data and we use the resulting outcomes as targets. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples uh, that are helpful to learn um, high quality uh, representation of images. One possible self-supervised task is uh, uh, the relative positioning task, where we have uh, some uh, patches coming from the same image, and we have to find a, a right relative position between these two patches. Another task is the colorization task, in which we start from a black and white image, and we have to, to put the right colors uh, uh, within the image. And another possible task uh, is the uh, recover uh, from uh, is to detect the right uh, rotation of an image and of course if we are able to solve this task uh, we probably learn representation a kind of higher level representation that have um, semantic information about the content of the image itself so this kind of uh, tasks can be very useful to learn high quality, high level representations. Recently, we have seen some attempts to learn join audio and video representation in a self-supervised way, but we also have seen some attempts that have extended the use of self-supervised learning to learn speech representations only. One example uh, is this work proposed by Philemon Brackel, uh, where uh, the author have developed a system able to learn independent features that turn out to be useful for a speech separation. Another important example is the constructive predictive coding work proposed by um, DeepMind people uh, where um, the system is able to learn features that are predictable about the future using a maximum, a maximum mutual information approach. Unfortunately, self-supervised learning on speech is really very challenging. Why? First of all, speech is a very high dimensional signal. Uh, if the sampling frequency is 16 kHz, we have uh, 16,000 samples for every second of speech, so it's really a lot. We does have very long sequences, and also uh, we have sequences of variable length because uh, we have a variable number of words inside inside the speech signal. Moreover, uh, as we have outlined before, uh, signal uh, speech is characterized by a complex hierarchical structure that could be very, very difficult to be captured without any label. Moreover, if you consider that uh, in the speech signal there is a huge variability due to speaker identity, gender, accent, and noise, you can easily agree that learning um, something uh, on speech, learning good representations on speech without any um, any supervision that can guide us, it's really, really a very challenging task. Well, our first attempt to learn good speech representation led to a technique that we have called local infomax, 
which is based on maximizing the mutual information between two uh, local encoded uh, speech representations. Um, the mutual information between two random variables is defined as the KL divergence uh, between their um, joint distribution and their product of marginal distributions. Uh, mutual information is a very meaningful uh, measure of divergence between two distributions uh, because different uh, to other metrics can also capture nonlinear relationship between these random variables. Um, the downside of mutual information is that it is clearly difficult to compute in high dimensional spaces. However, some recent works like mine found that it is possible to maximize or minimize mutual information within a framework that closely resemble that of generative adversarial networks. And in local Infomax, we took advantage of it to learn high quality uh, speaker, or in this case better, speaker representations. What we do is basically to maximize the mutual information between two random local representations extracted from the same sentence. Um, more specifically, uh, what we do is we, is we sample two different chunk of speech from the same sentence. In this case, we are using chunks of 200 milliseconds each. And we encode these, um, these uh, chunks using a neural encoder that give us a hopefully more compact and higher level representation. Note that if we sample two uh, random chunks of speech within the same sentence, one a common factor which is very reliable is the speaker identity. And so using this approach, we should be able to disentangle this constant factor from other variables factors that characterize the speech signals such as phonemes. So with this approach, we basically uh, probably highlight speaker identities rather than other characteristics of the speech signal. So this is a, um, a work that highlights speaker representation rather than uh, general speech representations. More precisely, the game we play is the following. First of all, we employ a sampling strategy that draws three a different chunks of speech. Uh, the first one uh, is a, a random chunk from a random sentence and we call it anchor chunk. Then we choose another random chunk from the same sentence and we call it positive chunk. And finally we draw another random chunk from another random sentence and we call it um, negative chunk and note that the negative chunk likely belongs to a different speaker. After that we process all these chunks with a neural encoder that give us uh, three different representation called um, anchor positive and negative representations. At this point we can form two types of uh, samples. We can concatenate the anchor representation and the positive representation uh, to form positive samples, which are basically samples from uh, the joint distribution. Then we can concatenate the anchor representation with the negative one. In this case, we form negative samples that can be seen, seen as samples drawn by the product of the marginal distributions. We then employ a discriminator uh, uh, which is alternately fed by positive and negative samples. And so uh, the discriminator should figure out if in input uh, we have a positive or negative samples, which in this case means that the discriminator should figure out if um, the two representation 
uh, uh, that uh, our um, in input comes from uh, the same speaker or from a different sentence. Well, to maximize the mutual information, we have to choose a proper loss for our discriminator. Um, at this point, different choices are possible. Uh, one is to use the mind objective, which is based on the don't curve are done bound of mutual information. We can use info noise constructive estimation uh, used in the context of the CPC paper we have um, mentioned before, which is very similar to the mind objective. And a very simple alternative is to simply use the binary cross entropy. Um, if you use binary cross entropy, we are not uh, uh, maximizing the KL divergence between the two distributions, but we are maximizing the Jensen Shannon divergence between them, which uh, uh, is not exactly mutual information, but still a very meaningful uh, measure of divergence between these two distributions. Uh, once we have defined the cost function, we can join and train everything, the encoder and the discriminator that in this case uh, are not adversarial because we play a max 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 game where the encoder and the discriminator should cooperate together to find good representations um, once we have uh, trained our representation our encoder in this way we can get rid of the discriminator and plug uh, a speaker identification system which is trained in a standard supervised way well, let me show you now some of the results that we have obtained with this technique. Um, one question that may arise at this point is, what is the best cost function uh, for our discriminator? And in this table, we report the classification error rate obtained on a speaker identification task using the LibreSpeech dataset, where we have um, basically more than 2400 speakers the first row shows the result that we have obtained with triplet loss here we even don't have the discriminator but we just apply a distance measure based on a cosine distance basically then we show the results in the second row uh, where we employ the discriminator with the mind objective the third line is the discriminator with the info NCE objective the CPC one, and the last uh, row shows the result that we have obtained when our discriminator is simply simply uh, uses the binary cross entropy as loss. Uh, okay, what are the insights that we have gained from this study? Basically, an important result is that uh, mutual information losses like mine, influence, and binary cross entropy. Um, basically outperforms the triplet loss. Uh, this confirms our intuition that uh, um, mutual information is a very meaningful measure of the divergence uh, between two distributions, much more meaningful than a simple cosine distance. Um, as you can see here from the table, the best results are obtained with the simple binary cross entropy. Um, similar to what uh, independently observed uh, in the context of computer vision, we have seen that um, the simple optimization of binary cross entropy, which is a bounded metric, is more uh, stable and uh, really uh, lead to um, better results. Okay, in this second table, we show uh, the classification error rate obtained on speaker ID still using um, libre speech uh, and we were considering explicitly considering two different acoustic conditions the standard clean one and our reverberating reverberated conditions where we have artificially contaminated all the speech sentences with uh, different impulse responses so in this case 
uh, we basically add a reverberation, which is a kind of convolutive noise, and we also add a channel effect because all the sentences are characterized, are contaminated by a different impulse response. Of course, um, this case, the reverberated case, is much, much more challenging than the standard clean one. Um, more specifically, the first um, row shows the results that we have obtained with the standard supervised approach, so without using any kind of um, self supervision as in our limb. And the remaining three lines uh, show the result that yeah, we have obtained using in different way in different ways our limb technique. In the first case, uh, limb frozen, we have uh, um, we have frozen the encoder and only trained the supervised speech speaker ID classifier. In the second case, we have pre-trained encoder with the self-supervised methodology we have discussed before, and then we have fine-tuned both the classifier and the encoder. Uh, the last row shows the results that we have obtained uh, when we train from scratch both encoder uh, this discriminator and the classifier. So what are the, the insights here? Uh, first of all, uh, LIM outperforms uh, the standard supervised classifier. So uh, this uh, is a clear indication that LIM uh, learns something uh, very useful for this task. And um, the gap between the supervised and LIM becomes more evident when we uh, add pre-training. So we pre-train our encoder and we fine-tune it during the supervised training of the speaker the, of the speaker and the classifier. The best results, however, are obtained uh, jointly training everything. Jointly training the encoder, the discriminator, and the classifier. Uh, well, of course, in the paper you may find uh, more results on that. For instance, you can find interesting results on the speaker verification using uh, the Voxelab dataset, and I will encourage you to read the paper if you are interested to see more results. Um, but in this presentation, I would like to do uh, a step forward. In fact, LIM has some strengths. For instance, we have seen that with LIM, we are able to highlight a high quality speaker representation. Uh, LIM is also a very simple and efficient technique because it's only based on local information. But in my opinion, there is um, a major issue. And the major issue is that uh, LIM representations are very task specific. What does it mean? It means that you can use LIM uh, successfully for speaker recognition tasks, but you cannot use it for other tasks like speech recognition, for instance. Uh, but this is not really what we want because we would like to learn high quality general representations that are helpful for a large variety of applications. And um, to do a step in this direction, uh, one has to consider that uh, all the previous approaches, including LIM and the other approaches that we have mentioned before, would uh, we'll like to learn kind of general speech representations using only single a single self-supervised task. So at some point I ask myself, is it really possible to capture the complex structure of speech with a single uh, self-supervised task only? Uh, well, my feeling and also my experience with, with LIM suggests no, because with a single self-supervised task, the risk is to focus only on very specific aspect of the speech signal. For instance, if you apply the LIM representation uh, to a speech recognizer, it doesn't work. If you try to um, reconstruct the waveform on the top of a limb representation, you fail because with this uh, very specific uh, self-supervised task, we get rid of all the information which is not considered useful. We just focus 
on speaker identification and we totally get rid of everything else. So what we can do? Well, the natural solution uh, will be thus to jointly tackle multiple self-supervised tasks where an ensemble of neural networks must cooperate together to discover good speech representations. Uh, what are uh, the intuitions um, behind that? First of all, if we employ uh, many self-supervised tasks, we have that each self-supervised uh, task brings a different view on the speech signal. And if we put together many different views of the speech signal, we have better chance to learn a more complete and more general speech representation. Moreover, uh, if we jointly learn multiple self-supervised tasks, um, a consensus across these different views is needed and we thus impose several soft constraints to the representation, uh, limiting uh, the risk of um, focusing on only specific or superficial aspect of the speech signal. So with this approach, we are more likely able to learn a general, robust, and transferable features. In practice, we propose to employ an encoder that takes in input the speech samples and gives in output a sequence of hopefully high level and better representations. We call this encoder a problem agnostic speech encoder because it turned out to be uh, useful for many different applications. And note that our encoder is only based on convolution neural networks where the first is layer, hidden layer is the recently proposed SyncNet model. Uh, then we employ several workers uh, which are just neural networks solving different self-supervised tasks. More specifically, uh, we jointly solve two kinds of self-supervised tasks. Um, some workers uh, solve uh, regression tasks, while other workers uh, solve binary classification tasks um, using uh, discriminators. Um, the regression workers uh, are basically based on uh, uh, a regressor and neural networks that estimate some kind of known speech representations. For instance, there is one worker that predicts uh, the input waveform in a kind of autoencoder fashion. There is another worker that predicts the log power spectrum, another one predicting the MELEC frequency capsule coefficients and one other predicting some kind of important features uh, uh, related to prosody like fundamental frequency or voice and voice probabilities. So I like to see this kind of regression workers as a way to inject prior knowledge into the encoder. In fact, there are some Mm, some speech representation that we know a priori that works very well and it will be great to inject uh, the information on this good representation into our encoder. Um, and this turned out to be very very important because uh, every time we have to solve a challenging task like uh, self-supervised or unsupervised learning uh, the prior knowledge and good and general prior knowledge is really, really helpful to, uh, to help us. Binary classification workers instead follow a framework similar to that we have discussed before in the context of local Infomax. Uh, in this case, we start from um, a speech dataset and we sample three chunks the anchor, the positive, and the negative chunks. And we sample them according to a predefined sampling strategy. 
Then we process all these chunks with our encoder and we employ uh, a discriminator that should figure out if the uh, in input we have a positive or a negative sample. In this case, the discriminator is trained with the binary cross entropy because, as we have seen before, this matrix uh, works very well for uh, this kind of tasks. Um, here, the idea is to have a positive and anchor representation that um, end up to be closed in some sense, and uh, while uh, negative and anchor representation uh, should be uh, distant in uh, some sense. So, all the binary classification workers uh, share this uh, framework. And the only difference is the particular sampling strategy that uh, is adopted. One of the binary worker is the local Infomax one that we have discussed before, where we um, sample two um, random chunks from the same sentence uh, and one uh, random chunks from another sentence. And as we have seen, uh, before, and in this way we highlight very well speaker identities. Another worker that we employ is uh, called Global Infomax, and uh, this is basically the same of Deep Infomax proposed uh, in the context of computer vision. Uh, the difference with LIM is that in this case the anchor representation is not local but it's global because it is uh, it, it is it uh, summarizes uh, the information of the full sentence um, there are many ways to uh, derive a local represent a global representation in our case we simply sum up all the local representations then after that we have sample the anchor we can sample a positive representation, which is again a local representation coming from the same sentence. And then we can sample the negative uh, chunk, which is uh, a random chunks from another sentence. Um, this uh, sampling strategy is a little bit different from LIM because we have a global representation. And uh, uh, in this way, we hope to extract some kind of global general information on the speed sequences, which are a little bit complementary uh, with that already extracted by uh, Lim. The last worker we employ is called sequence predictive coding, and it works in this way. Uh, first of all, we sample a random chunk from a random sentence. This is, again, a, a random local chunk. Uh, then we sample another chunk from the future of the anchor chunk and this is going to be the positive chunk then we sample another chunk from the past of the anchor chunk and this is going to be the negative chunk it is clear that in this way we try to learn a kind of a signal causality and we thus encourage our local representation to be predictable about the past and about the future. So in some sense, uh, we want local representation that capture uh, longer contextual information. Uh, note that uh, to avoid making this task uh, too easy, we avoid sampling uh, within the receptive field of our encoder, so we sample, uh, we, we cannot sample within 150 milliseconds, which is the receptive field of PAYS, uh, but at the same time, to avoid making this task too difficult, uh, we don't have to sample too far away from the anchor representation, so we restrict ourselves to sample within uh, 500 milliseconds. Um, this work is very similar to CPC proposed uh, by DeepMind um, guys. The only difference is that the negative sample is a sample from the past 
uh, of the anchor representation rather than being sampled from uh, another sentence. And the reason uh, why we have preferred this approach is that in this way we really uh, focus only on um, signal causality and we avoid um, focusing on other aspects of the speech signal like uh, speaker identity and so on that we have hopefully captured with uh, the other workers. Well, after defining the population of workers, uh, we can compute a cost function at the end of um, each neural network and we can compute the total loss simply as the average of each worker cost. Uh, then we can, uh, given this cost, we can jointly train uh, the encoder and the workers. And in this case, we have used the uh, Libre Speech dataset. An important remark is that um, uh, the encoder parameters will be updated, pointing to a direction that is a compromise uh, among all the workers. And here is where the cooperative aspect that we have mentioned before happens, because uh, basically gradient is a, a compromise between uh, a compromise among all the workers' needs. Uh, once we have trained this um, object in a self-supervised way, we can uh, get rid of all the workers and replace them with the standard neural network uh, trained in a standard supervised way. For instance, we can have networks that perform speaker ID, speech recognition, emotion recognition, and um, many other possible speech uh, classification tasks. Um, there are a couple of ways to use PACE in this context. One way is to uh, keep the encoder frozen during the supervised training. In this case, PIS is simply used as a kind of feature structure, um, while the other way is to pre-train PIS um, and fine-tune uh, both the classifier and um, the encoder during the, um, the supervised training phase. Okay, let me show you now some uh, results. Um, particular one question that may arise at this point is which of the self-supervised tasks that we have defined before are really needed. Uh, in table one we report the classification accuracies on three uh, speech classification tasks which are speaker identification on BCDK, emotion recognition on the interface dataset and um, phoneme classification, speech recognition uh, using the uh, TMIT dataset. The first row shows uh, the performance that is obtained uh, when all the tasks are, um, all the workers are active, while the other line shows uh, the, um, the absolute accuracy loss uh, obtained when discarding each worker. So what is the what are the insights that we can gain from this study? First of all, uh, very important uh, results is that uh, no worker is dispensable um, because the best results are achieved with all the workers. Uh, however, uh, the impact of the workers is really application dependent. For instance, there are some workers. Uh, that are helpful for all the speech tasks that we have tried, like uh, um, the waveform worker, the LPS worker, and the MFCC worker. And this basically confirms the importance of injecting prior knowledge on uh, known good representation inside the encoder. Some other workers instead um, turns out to be more application dependent. For instance, the prosody workers uh, works really well only for emotion recognition, and this is a kind of expected result. Um, Lim and Jim works better for speaker identification and for emotion recognition, while for um, ASR they don't uh, provide 
uh, any um, any improvement basically. And the reason is that probably Lim and Jim try to extract a uh, kind of global information on the speech uh, sequence that is not probably um, that useful for ASR. Similarly, also the SPC worker um, performs better on a speaker ID and emotion recognition tasks rather than for, from, for speech recognition. Um, the reason is that with uh, the SPC, we try to basically embed a larger time context. Uh, and a larger time context can be very useful for um, tasks like uh, uh, speaker ID and emotion recognition that, uh, in which we have the same label basically for all the sentence. Uh, and not that helpful for ASR. ASR is a more local task where we have to classify um, a phoneme at a different uh, at each time step, and the the receptive field of 150 milliseconds that we have used for our, our encoder is already enough uh, for obtaining a good classification accuracy, and we don't have to further increase the context using um, workers like uh, SPC. So what is important here is that even though uh, not all the workers are helpful, uh, the workers that are not helpful for some specific application do not um, harm the performance. So um, they can be still there without any um, performance loss. Uh, well, in this second table, we perform a comparison between uh, pays um, with uh, more standard uh, speech features. Here, we report in table 2 the accuracy uh, obtained on the consider classification task using uh, MLP and um, RNS as supervised classifiers. The first row shows the performance uh, that we have obtained with MFCC, the second with the FBank, and the third one uh, is basically an end-to-end uh, -end approach where we feed the encoder uh, with uh, row samples and we perform uh, the classification without any kind of self-supervised uh, pre-training. Uh, then the last two row, uh, rows reports the proposed approach. Uh, the first um, piece frozen uh, is um, the situation in which we uh, um, we freeze the encoder during the supervised training, so we use PACE as a, as a standard feature structure, and the other one is uh, the situation in which we use PACE as a pre-trained model in which we pre-train the encoder and we fine-tune it with the classifier. So what are the insights that we can gain from here? First of all, PACE uh, is often better than a standard MFCC and a filter banks, um, even when we, we froze uh, pace. And this is a good result because uh, MFCC and filter banks were proposed uh, several decades ago, but are very, very well designed features, and it's not really um, that easy um, to beat them even uh, after uh, many years. Uh, the best results, however, are obtained when pre-training the encoder and fine-tuning it. And you can see here clearly um, a gain over more standard features. Um, and uh, yes, you can see that this approach consist consistently provides the best performance over all the tasks and classifiers that we have considered here. So note that this um, uh, performance of uh, a team it is a very very competitive state of the art results, uh, especially considering uh, that here we are not using any speaker adaptation technique. Finally, to study how much our features are transferable to different acoustic conditions, we have done um, experiments using the Dura corpus. In particular, here we have trained uh, our representation using 
uh, the Libre Speech dataset, which is perfectly, perfectly clean, and we have done some speech recognition experiment on the DIRA corpus, which is a Wall Street Journal-based corpus characterized by a lot of noise and a lot of reverberation. And here the results are reported in terms of word error rates, so the lower uh, the better. And um, interestingly, here we have seen um, that uh, PACE works very well even in this uh, scenario. Uh, and this was a very um, good result, I think, because uh, PACE is not explicitly designed to be robust against uh, noise and vibration, but still we can see uh, results which are a little bit better than uh, more standard features. So this suggests that um, our uh, representation is somehow robust uh, against the uh, noise and vibration and is transferable not only um, to different speech applications but also to uh, different acoustic conditions. Okay, conclusion. Um, in this presentation, we have seen a couple of approaches for learning uh, speech representations using uh, self-supervised learning. One is LIM that turned out to be useful for speaker recognition applications, while PACE is a more general uh, neural speech encoder that carry important, important information related at least to speaker identities, phonemes, and emotional cues. Uh, we design our encoder to be efficient because it's just based on convolutional neural networks, uh, and our PACE encoder can be used as a standard feature structure or as a pre-trained model, as commonly done uh, within the computer vision community. Uh, our work can be seen as a first step towards a universal speech feature structure, uh, but uh, there is a lot of room for improvement, and in the next months we will uh, work a lot to come out with a better version of our encoder. Meanwhile, you can take a look to our code, which is totally open source, and you can uh, start playing with um, our PACE encoder. That's really all. Thank you very much for your attention.